Good morning, everyone. Awfully quiet in here, very subdued. Uh, I wanted to uh, welcome everyone here, including my fellow Irish Americans. It is, after all, alternative St. Patrick's Day here <laughs> at the White House. Thank you very much. This is actually Josh Ernest's tie. We switched. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good, huh? He came to my aid, and I appreciate it. Um, uh, I do not have any uh, other comments to make at the top of the briefing. Uh, so I'll just go straight to questions. Ken? Jay, just a couple topics. Um, the, uh, one of the budget, the House Republicans released a budget plan today that would uh, include cuts to the safety net programs for the poor. Uh, it proposes um, lower tax rates. Does the administration see value in this plan? <coughs> Do you guys see this as a, as, a, as a starting point for potential compromise on these issues? Unfortunately, no. Because what the Ryan plan uh, fails to do is in any way meet the test of balance that every credible person in this debate has said must be met if we are going to deal with our fiscal challenges in the future. In this room, we have had a lot of talk about uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission, the Rivlin-Domenici Commission, the President's budget proposal. All of those share in common at their core a recognition of the fact that there is no responsible way to deal with our budget challenges uh, if we do not do it in a balanced way. If we do not include both discretionary spending cuts, uh, reforms to our entitlement programs, uh, uh, cuts in our defense spending, and cuts in our tax expenditures. We need to make sure that it, the effort to get our fiscal house in order uh, that the burden of, of that effort is not borne solely by senior citizens uh, and uh, families with disabled children uh, or the poor and unfortunately or the middle class and unfortunately what we see in this proposal is again much like its predecessor uh, essentially a, a, a shift of uh, money from the middle class seniors and lower income Americans, disabled Americans, to the wealthiest Americans, the wealthiest among us, a, a $150,000 on average tax cut, additional tax cut for the wealthiest Americans. Uh, a program that would voucherize Medicare and end, it as, uh, end Medicare as we know it uh, and create a system in Medicare where uh, seniors are progressively basically priced out of the market and more and more of the burden of their own health care costs is borne by them, uh, a burden that they cannot bear, many of them. So it is uh, not a plan that this president could support. It's not a plan that uh, not just Democrats but responsible Republicans could support if they supported uh, Bull Simpson or Domenici Rivlin or other efforts to deal with this problem in a balanced way. Uh, and it's not one that we think the American people would broadly support uh, because it's not right for the economy and it's not right for the vast majority of the American people. Do the tax rates give you diminished hope that you could have some sort of uh, basis for tax reform perhaps in a late up session? Well, I, you know, it, it's hard to anticipate what the end of the year will look like. Let's put that aside. I, driving in this morning, I have satellite radio, I was listening to uh, a news program and I heard uh, Chairman Ryan on and he was asked about the tax rates and the lowering of the tax rates in his proposal and then a responsible questioner said well how are you gonna pay for that well I know there aren't any specifics here we'll just let the Ways and Means Committee handle that in a transparent way so that's the message to the American people we will let Congress make sure that uh, a system that gives massive tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans somehow isn't paid for on the backs of the middle class I don't think that's a, that's a bait and switch the American people want to engage in, particularly. Uh, we've seen it before. We've heard it before. It's not the right approach, and it's not fair. I just want to ask you on Ron. Um, the, the President issued a statement on the Persian New Year. Um, he accused the regime of trying to drape an electronic curtain 
of uh, uh, this was a message by video. Does the administration have a sense of how many people actually saw it? You know, I would refer you to the State Department. I don't have that uh, figure for you. Obviously, one of the central messages that uh, is contained within it is this issue of an uh, electronic curtain, the efforts uh, at many levels by the Iranian regime to uh, restrict access to information uh, uh, to their own people because they're afraid uh, that uh, uh, of what uh, the Iranian people might do uh, with uh, the truth and knowing uh, the truth about uh, the way they're treated by their uh, uh, regime, uh, the way that Iran is viewed and the Iranian regime is viewed by the international community, the um, extensive international consensus uh, that exists uh, that uh, uh, points the finger at Tehran and its refusal to live up to its uh, obligations, its international obligations, uh, the incredible price that is being paid uh, by Iran uh, uh, because of the sanctions regime that uh, continues to be ratcheted up uh, as a result of the regime's failure to live up to its uh, obligations. Uh, so um, it is a multifaceted effort by the regime, uh, and it is, uh, demonstrates just how uh, fearful the regime is of the truth. Reuters. Hey. Jeff. Uh, Saudi Arabia said today <laughs> that uh, oil prices were not justified at their current levels and that it stood ready to pump more oil if there were buyers. Does the United States <coughs> agree that oil prices are not justified at the prices that they're currently at? And would you like Saudi to pump more oil? <coughs> well, let me say two things. One, the President is very concerned about the high price of gasoline that American consumers are paying uh, when they're filling up their tanks. It is obviously a burden for American families trying to make ends meet, uh, and it is one of the reasons, as I've said before, uh, why it was so essential to extend the payroll tax cut uh, and give 160 million Americans uh, extra money uh, in their pockets to help uh, deal with these uh, added costs uh, that every family is dealing with. On, on Saudi Arabia, I think the Treasury Secretary has commented on this, so I would refer you uh, to his comments uh, about it. I'm not going to get into sort of broad conversation or speculation about the global oil markets. Would you like, maybe sort of more generally then, as the President goes out on a tour to talk about energy and as you continue to express your concern about gasoline prices, is there more that other countries in the inter international community could be doing or that the United States would like to have them do to help bring those prices down? It is certainly true that uh, the price of oil is uh, driven by a global market. And I, that's a point I make when asked about uh, what tools uh, the American government has to uh, drive down prices uh, at the pump, and, and those tools are limited in the near term. Beyond that, I would simply say that we as a nation, our government, is in regular consultations with and conversations with oil produ producing states as well as our allies uh, around the globe. Uh, for whom this is an issue. Uh, certainly, as we mentioned before, a topic of conversation between the President and the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain. Uh, and it's a topic of conversation between uh, uh, this government and governments around the world uh, fairly regularly because of the, uh, the prominence of the issue right now. Is there governments you want to mention? Uh, I, I don't have any specifics for you. I just want to follow up from my question yesterday. Um, today is the FEC filings curious to find out which White House officials had appeared at Priorities USA events and how they felt that operation was going. You know, I don't have that information for you. I can take the question. Um, again, as this administration, as previous administrations have of both parties, uh, uh, allows for the fact that White House officials, cabinet officials, on their own time, private time, can participate in political activity. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have any details. Dead. Then Dan. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on Congressman Ryan's budget because you hit him for not having details on taxes, but you haven't put all your details on taxes on the table either. The Buffett rule has been a principle that you've talked mm -hmm. about around what you want the tax rate to be as a minimum, but the President hasn't put those details on the table either. So how can you hit the Ryan plan for not having details when... Right. Well, let's look at the difference between a, a principle like the Buffett rule, which would say that if you make a million dollars or more, you should not pay... Uh, a lower effective tax rate uh, 
than uh, hardworking, uh, lower income or middle income American, uh, Warren Buffett's secretary, for example. Uh, the other side of this is to say we're going to dramatically cut income tax rates, most dramatically for the highest income Americans, uh, bequeathing upon them an enormous tax break coming uh, after uh, many tax breaks in the previous decade for that very same uh, population of Americans, and uh, promise that we'll explain how we're going to pay for it later. Uh, I think there's a big difference. And I think for average Americans out there, uh, there's a big difference. Uh, one is about uh, essential fairness, about closing loopholes that uh, unnecessarily uh, benefit uh, those uh, of, the, uh, of us who are the wealthiest in the country. Uh, I say us, uh, unfortunately, I don't mean me. But, the, um, but, but uh, another is uh, a program that says, you know, we're going to give more tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans, but um, without saying how we're going to pay for them. And the implication is there really is only one way to pay for them, right? You either, you either uh, have the middle class pay for them uh, directly through higher taxes on the middle class or on lower income Americans, or you have seniors pay for them, uh, which the voucherization of Medicare uh, essentially demands. Or you, uh, you pay for them, and it's probably an all-of-the-above approach uh, in this case, uh, or you have them paid for through uh, dramatic cuts in education, in research and development, uh, and in other essential uh, aspects of our discretionary budget, uh, which, which the Ryan Republican plan actually makes clear is their plan. So those are choices that uh, this president feels are not right for the American people, or right, are not right for the American economy right now. And, uh, you know, to the extent that this is a debate uh, that we'll be engaged in again this year, the, you, know, you know, we are ready to have that debate. Quick follow-up. Mr. Noller had a blog post, I think, earlier today saying that uh, the debt rose $4.899 trillion under President Bush and has now risen $4.939 trillion under President Obama. So the question is, you don't like the Ryan plan, but the um, President obviously inherited a lot of debt from the Bush administration but has now added more mm -hmm. debt than his predecessor. So if you want to hit the Ryan plan, what credibility do you have that you're going to cut the debt? Well, we put forward a plan, in, in uh, uh, very clear plan, that uh, achieves over $4 trillion in deficit reduction, that achieves, as uh, the CBO recently uh, uh, re-estimated, uh, brings our deficits uh, uh, down as a share of GDP to a very manageable level and drives down our debt. Uh, and it does it in a balanced way that includes the $1.2 trillion in real cuts agreed to by this President and Congress last summer, uh, and then builds upon those with uh, reforms and entitlements that produce savings and in uh, uh, raising revenue uh, by asking uh, oil companies, oil and gas companies, to give up 100 years of subsidies by the American taxpayer at a time when they're making near record profits, again, uh, that asks hedge fund managers not to pay the income tax rate that you pay, uh, I mean, to, to pay the income tax that you pay, rather than uh, to, 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 on their substantial income, uh, pay uh, an exceptionally low rate, a much lower rate than uh, working class and middle class Americans, you know? And then, uh, you know, it, that's the balanced approach that uh, Republicans who supported Simpson-Bowles believed was right. It's the balanced approach that Republicans who supported the Gang of Six proposal believed was right. It's, it's, the, it's the balanced approach that Republicans who supported the, the uh, Rivlin Diminishy Commission believed was right. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have not seen that same recognition of the, essential, of the need for essential balance uh, uh, by uh, House Republicans uh, or by a majority of Republicans in either chamber. Laura Meckler, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, the, a couple questions. First, on the Ryan budget. It, there, since his last budget, he's made some changes in how he approaches Medicare. Mm -hmm. Do those changes, um, are they headed in the right direction? Are you, do you feel like the Medicare proposal this time is something closer to what you would like to see than what he proposed a year ago? Um, unfortunately, no. I, we, we do not believe uh, that there is uh, uh, much difference at all in this proposal. It is still uh, a proposal that uh, creates a voucher system for Medicare and thereby ends Medicare as we know it, uh, contrary to some assessments that somehow by calling it Medicare, it still remains Medicare. We're going to stand by uh, 
the fact that uh, Medicare as we know it would be ended by this program. And it creates basically, uh, it segments uh, the Medicare population. I mean, one of the reasons why uh, Medicare has worked and why uh, seniors in this country uh, support and want Medicare to continue is because uh, all risk is pooled currently for Medicare recipients, a and the guarantee that exists for Medicare is exists for all. If you segment the Medicare population into a part private, part public system, uh, what happens is Private insurance companies, understandably, because they're market driven, are going to cherry pick the healthiest, youngest seniors, pull them into uh, their private plans, which just makes the pool of Americans, of seniors who uh, continue on uh, the traditional Medicare system, older and sicker, which drives up costs, which then drives more, uh, uh, you know, creates more pain for those Americans uh, who can't afford it. That's, that's a recipe for destroying Medicare as we know it, not saving it or strengthening it. But that's what Medicare Advantage is today. What we've seen in Medicare, well that's why Medicare Advantage is not the foundational program of the system. Like one, one of the reasons why we know that uh, doing this uh, doesn't work is because of what we've seen in some of the Medicare Advantage studies. I mean you can't, uh, you, if, you, if you were to replace Medicare with Medicare Advantage, that's, that's, that's a problem you would have. Message to Iran uh, and also the action by the Treasury Department today on a related front. Um, essentially, how much of a difference do you think this is going to make in terms of the ability of Iranians to actually get more information? In terms of the action that we're taking? Yeah, the action that the, the administration is taking. To allow certain companies to uh, that, that provide uh, information technology? Yeah. Well, uh, I, fortunately, there remain some avenues for Iranians to get access to information. Uh, we want to uh, do what we can to allow companies, you know, to give, make sure that those companies understand that they can continue to provide services like that to the Iranian people. Uh, it's hard to measure what that impact will be, uh, but it is vital. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, we have had, uh, we believe, the, uh, the, the upheaval in, in, in the Middle East that we've seen in, these last, uh, in this last period is because uh, because the, of the information that, that uh, people in the region have been getting about uh, what a better life would look like and the, and the demands that uh, they have then been making when they hit the streets saying, uh, you know, we want uh, more democracy. We want uh, a government that respects and uh, works for us and doesn't, as in the case of uh, Syria or Libya before it, uh, brutalize us and repress us. So uh, access to information is a, is a very powerful tool uh, in the effort to uh, provide uh, greater democracy and greater freedom for people around the world. And just lastly, the, you s said that you would take the question on Priorities USA, but you had also said the same thing yesterday, that you would take that same question. So is this something that you are? I, no, I honestly, right. I, I, I'll, I'll see if I can get an answer. But I, uh, again, I, the, I, just, I, I didn't uh, uh, look into it yesterday. I just forgot. But, the, but it is simply, I mean, it is a fact that this, in this administration, as in previous administrations, officials in the White House and the Cabinet uh, are uh, able to participate on their own time and political activities. So uh, if there's more information, I will, uh, I will get it. The information, it's just that you have well, let me, let me just see what, uh, you know, what, what we are gathering here versus you know, what uh, organization that you referenced or others might have to give out, because you know, we're not collecting all, all this data, it's not really, again, this is private activity, not, not White House activity. Yes, Dan. Thank you. Does the President believe that oil companies and hedge fund managers are hurting the economy? The President believes that the tax breaks, the loopholes and subsidies that exist that provide uh, $4 billion in taxpayer money to oil and gas companies, for example, or uh, provide untold millions and billions in, in, in tax benefits to uh, some of the wealthiest Americans who take advantage of the carried interest rule, uh, that, that those provisions are not helpful to the economy and they, and they are not fair. Uh, and that removing them would, be, would create benefits for the economy by uh, m creating a fairer tax system, one that, that uh, is, is uh, fairer to the broader majority of the American people in the middle class uh, that, that should not be paying 
in the case of the carried interest rule, uh, their income taxes at a higher rate than hedge fund managers who, I mean, let's be honest about what a carried interest rule is. We, you know, you guys understand it. It's not, this isn't, this isn't even investment interest, I mean, uh, income. It, this is basically being paid for their work, uh, but because of a loophole in the tax code, they're being, it, it, they're getting to, to pay taxes at a substantially lower rate as if it were investment income. So uh, that doesn't seem right to this president. It doesn't seem right to a heck of a lot of people, and it ought to end. Everyone, I think, agrees that the economy is in a much better place now. Mitt Romney has admitted that the economy is doing better. Um, does the he president, said that? Does, does the president believe that this is a function of what he has done, the president himself, or is it just part of a natural cycle, what goes down comes up? Two things. The reason why America always comes back when it's down is because of the American people. The president firmly believes that. Uh, it is also the case that when he took office in January of 2009, we are on uh, the edge of an abyss. Uh, we face the potential for a global financial meltdown uh, and the possibility of uh, unemployment and economic contraction, the likes of which we had not seen uh, since the Great Depression. And that we did experience both of those things, the worst recession since the Great Depression, the worst unemployment since the Great Depression, uh, and the worst economic contraction, but not nearly as severe as we could have if we had not made the right choices, if we had not done the things we did to stabilize the economy, to uh, stabilize the financial sector, to uh, salvage uh, and revivify the automobile industry, to uh, provide uh, essential assistance to uh, states and municipalities so that they wouldn't have to lay off masses and masses of teachers and firefighters and police officers. Uh, and, and, and get our economy going in the right direction again. That has resulted in uh, quarter after quarter now of economic growth, positive economic growth. It has resulted in uh, two years of positive uh, private sector job growth. Um, unfortunately, the hole was so deep uh, that we're not out of it yet, but we're moving in the right direction. And another subject, uh, yesterday you were asked about Trayvon Martin, whether you mm -hmm. had a conversation with the president about that. And have you had a conversation I have no uh, conversations to report out to you. I can I, I, I note that uh, uh, the Justice Department has uh, said that it's looking into the matter, and I would refer you to to the Justice Department. Obviously, our our thoughts and prayers, as I said yesterday, are with uh, Trayvon Martin's family. Uh, but beyond that, not least because there is an investigation going on, I don't have uh, uh, anything else I can add. You have nothing to read out, but you, have you had a conversation with him about this? Yeah, I, t I talked to him about a lot of things. Yes. Um, there's talk out of Europe that Syria, uh, the wife of uh, Syrian President Bashar Assad, Azam Assad, might be placed on a new sanctions list along with several other family members. And these alleged emails from Assad that were leaked saying that uh, um, he was able to brag about getting around U.S. sanctions because he got an iTunes account with a fake New York address and New York uh, identity. What, is there more that the U.S. can do on the sanctions front, in particular with Syria? And what do you guys make of him bragging about getting around these sanctions? Well, I'll make two points. There, there is more, and, and uh, we are working with our allies to uh, put greater pressure on uh, the Assad regime to uh, isolate it further, uh, deprive it of uh, economic lifeblood. Uh, I don't have specific new sanctions to announce today, uh, but we're certainly working with the Friends of Syria, working with our international partners uh, to do everything we can to uh, put greater pressure on Assad. With regards to those emails, I saw that, and it just, it's really sickening, if you think about it, that a man who is overseeing the slaughter of his own people uh, is chortling about uh, evading sanctions and getting an iTunes account. Uh, th there may be no better image for uh, uh, the kind of uh, heartless and brutal uh, approach that he's taken to uh, the demands of his own people uh, for greater democracy uh, and better treatment from their own government. Is there anything with the defense of Syria um, <coughs> event at the end, end of this month that we well, can we're expect new policy? But we're, we're, uh, we are working uh, very much uh, preparing for that uh, Friends of Syria meeting. We're obviously very concerned about uh, getting uh, humanitarian aid to the Syrian people. Uh, that's a, a constant subject of conversation now and will be, I'm sure, at that meeting. Uh, we uh, fully support the Kofi Annan mission, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, and uh, we're working with our allies uh, 
uh, within the Friends of Syria and, 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 and with, uh, with nations, uh, uh, both at the United Nations and elsewhere, to, to look at every way we can to put greater pressure on uh, the Assad regime. We have specific right now that you I don't have anything to new to add today. Nora, I think we're Afghanistan, the President sure. has talked about a steady drawdown of forces. Has he solicited yet from his commanders a recommendation for the next phase? Uh, I believe General Allen is testifying today on the Hill uh, uh, broadly about Afghanistan, obviously, since he's the commanding uh, general. And uh, uh, on that issue, I, I, I believe that we are uh, in the process of drawing down the surge forces the President sent in. Uh, we will have withdrawn all of those forces by the end of this summer, middle of September, and that assessments will be made, will be made about uh, the pace of continued drawdowns uh, as we get closer to that. Uh, period where we've drawn down the surge forces. So I don't, uh, I don't believe that there have been uh, uh, new proposals put out about uh, or, or asked for for a, a, a new withdrawals. I think I made this point in, in regards to a, an article that appeared in the newspaper that was uh, incorrect about uh, proposals that supposedly were circulating uh, that uh, are not and have not. Does the President have to have any recommendations from his generals before the NATO summit in May? The, uh, I think I made clear last week uh, when we were talking about Afghanistan that there will be, there, while uh, Afghanistan will clearly be a subject of intense discussion uh, in Chicago at, at the NATO summit, uh, you should not anticipate a new announcement about uh, troop withdraw withdrawal schedules uh, in Chicago. Uh, so uh, there is a time frame. I'm sorry? Should not. That's correct. The. Uh, the uh, NATO is operating under a, uh, a time frame in Afghanistan that was established at Lisbon. Uh, and as we have said in recent days, uh, including coming out of the President's uh, most recent phone conversation with President Karzai, we are uh, in the process of transitioning security uh, lead over to the Afghan security forces. We are, uh, we will by some point in 2013 have uh, transferred combat lead over to Afghan security forces. We will still be in a support role with uh, those Afghan forces on uh, some missions. And by 2014, the full process of transition to full Afghan security lead will have taken place in accordance with the Lisbon decision. Um, again, numbers in terms of pace of withdrawal, uh, we don't have for you. Uh, but it, this is all about implementing a strategy that the President put in place, which was designed very clearly to focus the mission on the number one objective, which is uh, going after Al Qaeda, uh, stabilizing Afghanistan in support of that objective, uh, so that uh, time and space was created, and stability was created, so that uh, we could help train up Afghan forces and uh, prepare them to take over responsibility for their own security and bring American men and women home. And that's happening now, and it will continue to happen. And then can I ask you? There's been some excellent reporting um, over the last several days about Sergeant Bales. Uh, he was accused of the civilian massacre in Afghanistan and some of the stresses uh, that were on his family. Did the President read some of those stories? Has he expressed any concern or comment about Sergeant Bale's condition and his family? Uh, Nora, I don't have any conversations with the President to read out to you. I can, I can tell you that uh, setting aside an individual case and, and obviously uh, a matter that's under investigation, that uh, the issue of stress on our armed forces, those serving in uh, uh, theaters like Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, is always, uh, has, has been a focus of this administration since the President took office. Uh, PTSD in particular is something that we uh, have, uh, have put a focus on, uh, both here and at the uh, Veterans Administration. Uh, and uh, it's something the President talked about when he was running for office, that uh, this is clearly a period of uh, extended combat for uh, the American military. Uh, we ended, uh, as promised, uh, in a responsible way. Uh, the President did the war in Iraq, uh, but that was a nine-year conflict. Uh, and we are obviously in, in Afghanistan now um, for, uh, for over 10 years. So uh, one of the reasons why the President is so focused on uh, executing a strategy that has very specific priorities and objectives uh, and, and achieving those objectives and bringing Americans home uh, is because he does not believe that uh, we should be in, Afghan in Afghanistan any longer than we need to be to achieve that mission. He wants to bring our troops home 
uh, as soon as possible. And then final question. Um, Vice President Biden uh, was in New Jersey for a fundraiser, and he was talking about the bin Laden raid. Mm -hmm. And he said you could not find a more <coughs> audacious plan if you go back in history 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> what did he mean by that? I think he meant that the decision the President made, uh, as you all know and, and are aware of, uh, was a very difficult one that uh, as has been uh, uh, reported that the um, information that we had, which was obviously of a high quality, uh, was not conclusive, that the um, advice the President was getting from his senior most uh, national security advisors uh, was mixed on what to do, uh, mixed at best, and uh, that in the end uh, he had to make a very fateful decision. And as he said, he, he, one of the reasons why he felt so confident in making that decision was that uh, he knew that the forces he would send in uh, on the bin Laden mission were the absolute best that have ever existed, and that they would fulfill their mission um, with uh, great professionalism and success. Uh, obviously, uh, it would have been a different story if, uh, if bin Laden had not been in that compound, but the President that's why you're president. You have to make those tough calls, and I think that's what uh, Vice President Biden was referring to. Well, the uh, historical assessments I'll leave to him and others, but uh, there's no question that this was a very, very difficult decision uh, that uh, only commanders in chief have to make. No, yes. You didn't miss me. No. Yeah. Jay, do you have any reaction to the dozens of people? I believe the latest estimate, more than 40 people who were killed uh, in Iraq. Well, we are um, certainly aware of uh, the attacks. We strongly condemn the attacks on innocent civilians in Iraq, a blatant attempt by extremists to undermine Iraq's progress toward a more secure, stable, and prosperous future. We offer our condolences to the victims uh, of these uh, reprehensible acts, as well as their families and loved ones, and we support the continued efforts of Iraq's security forces to, uh, to bring those responsible to justice. You know, what, what is true is even as we see these um, these attacks now, which are clearly aimed at trying to uh, uh, get attention uh, in, in the uh, run-up to Iraq hosting the uh, Arab League summit, uh, is that uh, despite these efforts uh, by extremists, violence in Iraq remains at uh, near historic lows. Uh, and uh, Iraqi forces have demonstrated their capacity uh, to deal with the security challenges that exist in that country. Uh, again and again in recent years, and we have um, uh, we do have uh, uh, faith in their ability to to show that again, that ability again. To what extent uh, is the administration, is the president, concerned that these latest killings does sort of um, destabilize the region there? Well, I think that, as I just said, that the we have seen some spectacular attacks in Iraq over the uh, over. Uh, over the number of years that this president's been in office, uh, all uh, aimed at trying to uh, destabilize the situation in Iraq. Overall, however, the violence levels in Iraq remain at near historic lows, and uh, Iraqi forces have proven uh, themselves capable of maintaining security and, and proven themselves uh, to have been, uh, thanks in no small measure to the training that they received from uh, U.S. forces. Uh, to be uh, professionally capable of dealing with security challenges, which doesn't mean that there won't be spectacular attacks again in the future, uh, but you have to put them in context. And just uh, on Syria, sure. Jay, um, according to recent reports, the insurgents there are now being accused of human kidnapping, torture of pro-government forces. Uh, to what extent does this complicate efforts to get humanitarian aid to the region? Uh, <coughs> and to what extent does it look like this is sort of spiraling or descending into a civil war? Well, I would say on those reports that we have seen them and uh, of those and other reports of excesses committed against security forces, and we would denounce those attacks as we have previously denounced killings of Syrian security personnel. Expanding the scope of violence harms the Syrian people first and foremost, and this violence must stop. We should also note, however, that uh, these attacks would not take place if the Syrian government wasn't brutally and indiscriminately attacking Syrian cities and civilians one by one. While the regime's crackdown does not justify violent responses other than in self-defense, we would note that there are many more reports of unspeakable atrocities at the hands of government forces and reiterate our call for the Syrian government to halt its attacks on cities. Uh, 
so uh, let's be clear, we, we, we absolutely uh, uh, denounce attacks like these and killings like these. You know, we've seen these reports and, and, and we would denounce them. Uh, within the context of what's happening in Syria, we cannot lose sight of the fact uh, that the great preponderance of violence uh, against civilians and innocent people is being uh, perpetrated by uh, forces under the control of the Assad regime. Okay. Jackie Collins. Um, Jay, when this is the second week, I guess, in, in succession that the president is making uh, energy the focus of his activities, his public activities, um, will that continue as gas prices remain high or go higher? And at, you know, does it mean you will be talking less about job creation? Yes and no. He will continue to talk about uh, the absolute need to have an all of the above approach to our energy challenges, uh, to the uh, need to have American-made energy. He will also continue to talk about uh, jobs and economic growth. Both are, are uh, urgent priorities in this country. And I would simply take a little issue with the premise of the question that somehow the focus he's been uh, demonstrating on energy issues of late is wholly different from where he's been. Uh, one of the reasons why we can report to you that we are well on our way to doubling the production of renewable energy in this country is because of the President's focus on investments in alternative energy sources in this country uh, from the time he took office. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, we can report to you that we are continuing to increase domestic oil and gas production in this country is because of the focus that he has put on uh, growing domestic oil and gas production in this country since he took office. I mean, as a, someone who spent a lot of time at a lot of energy events with the Vice President and who noted in the first several years uh, the President's attention to these issues, um, I think we can uh, confidently say that this has been a priority and a focus of this administration from day one. And also there was, the, you've mentioned before, in the last year when prices went up for gasoline, uh, this Justice Department task force on oil speculation. Has the President ever received a report either last year or this year about that? Does he, has he I'll have to check if there was a, a formal report, uh, and I would refer you to the Justice Department about uh, the efforts that the uh, task force or, or, or unit um, undertook last year. As you know, we've the President, at the President's request, the Attorney General has uh, uh, reconstituted uh, the task force and asked them to again uh, investigate potential uh, fraud and speculation, um, because we need to do everything we can to ensure that uh, American, hardworking Americans aren't getting ripped off uh, at gas stations. Uh, it is certainly the case that the global price of oil uh, is what drives the price of gasoline, uh, and that is hard enough for Americans to deal with. We need to make sure, uh, protectively, that uh, they're not getting gouged uh, because of speculation and fraud. Margaret. Thanks. I know we will probably get a briefing later in the week, but um, for those of us who can't wait, um, could you give us a little bit uh, of a sense of what the President really hopes to accomplish at this nuclear summit in Korea and what message he also wants to send to North Korea and Iran? Um, and as a secondary question, there are these two treaties that he talked about wanting Congress to ratify that have to do with uh, nuclear security, and I'm just wondering that those are nowhere in sight. Is there anything that any message to Congress on those this week? Well, the president looks forward to his visit to uh, uh, to Seoul to the participate in the nuclear security summit. As you know, the president uh, made nuclear security a priority when he took office and hosted uh, a security summit, nuclear security summit here in Washington, uh, and he will continue that work at this uh, summit in, in Korea. You will be getting brief on more details about what we expect from this visit, uh, perhaps sooner than you think. But the, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of specifics right now for you to read out from the podium about what, uh, what will happen uh, next week in Korea, um, or on the on the treaties that you that you uh, mentioned. So we'll have to get that information for you. This sure. may be part of that, but. Um, new free trade deal uh, with Korea, a lot of other stuff. Will mm -hmm. there be non-nuclear aspects of this uh, of this trip uh, that he'll want to talk about? You know, I'll have to, I'll have to refer you to, uh, to our friends at the uh, National Security staff and uh, for specifics on that. I, you know, I, it, he will obviously spend some time with um, our host and uh, uh, the South Korean uh, leader, but beyond that, I don't have any details for you. Any, uh, any thoughts on uh, the latest out of Denver? I'm sorry? Denver. 
How about that, huh? I don't know. Who's going to get Tebow? What do you think? Is there a pool? Is that what you meant? Yeah. Are you a Broncos fan? No? I just thought maybe that would come up with the president. I thought yeah. I'd ask. <laughs> I, I actually have not. I can report out that I have not had that conversation with him yet, but I look forward to it. Chris. Yeah, um, I want to ask about uh, some comments made by the First Lady last night. The first one to follow up on uh, this executive order issue. In February 2008, uh, then-candidate uh, Obama told the Houston GLBT caucus that he would support a federal non-discrimination policy for federal contractors as president that would include sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, just wondering if, if the president has changed his position on that since then, and if not, why he hasn't taken any action to implement that policy. Well, all I would say is since this is in reference to a uh, conversation we've had a few times uh, in this room about uh, an executive order, I just, I'm not going to comment on an executive order uh, that may or may not be under consideration at this time. Uh, when I have more, policy. I, I have no updates on his positions or policies uh, to give you on that matter. But I, uh, with regards to the questions about uh, an executive order, I just don't have any comment on it uh, at this time. Um, as yeah. for the first lady, mm -hmm. um, last night at, at two different events in in New York City, she made reference to the effect that Supreme Court appointees will have on whether we can love whomever we choose. Hmm. Is that a reference to marriage equality? And if not, to, to what is that a reference? No, thank you for the question. I think um, as uh, folks who regularly report on the, on the First Lady's speeches, they'll know that she uh, has said this before and, and has for some time. And that is a reference uh, to the President's position on the Defense of Marriage Act. The President and First Lady firmly believe that gay and lesbian Americans and their families deserve legal protections and the ability to thrive just like any family does. The First Lady has said she is proud of his accomplish, uh, accomplishments, including uh, repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, ensuring hospital visitation rights, and calling for the repeal of DOMA. And obviously, our actions on DOMA and our decision not to uh, defend DOMA is well known. She That's what she was referring that to. That that is a, a ref she does not believe uh, it was a reference. In marriage it was referenced to, to, to DOMA. Yes? Uh, heading into this. Uh, Soul visit. How do the president's thoughts about a world without nuclear weapons, as he enunciated in the Prague speech uh, today, compare with his thoughts back then, given what's happened with uh, Iran and North Korea since then? Well, I haven't had that high altitude conversation with him. I know that, that uh, nuclear security is uh, a very high priority for this president. That's why he hosted the summit that he hosted here. That's why he's going to Seoul. Um, it has uh, been noted by others, and I'll note it here, that the efforts this president has undertaken uh, with regards to uh, unifying the international community against Iran uh, in demanding that Iran uh, give up its nuclear weapons ambitions and get right with the world, begin to honor its international obligations, uh, has been uh, is proof of his concern about and his focus on uh, the uh, the threat of nuclear prolif proliferation. And, and, and one of the reasons is he's noted that uh, it is essential to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon is that it would cause uh, a terrible nuclear weapons arms race in the region, uh, which uh, would obviously um, greatly diminish nuclear security around the world. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we have, uh, I, I, mean, if you, I, I don't have anything new for you, particularly on, on, on the efforts in North Korea. Uh, that, too, is of great concern. Um, you know, we've had some developments in that arena uh, of late that you know about. Uh, but this is an extremely high priority, the, the, uh, the efforts that uh, the United States and other countries have undertaken to try to secure nuclear materials and to provide, try to prevent uh, dangerous regimes from acquiring nuclear weapons uh, have been very robust. And that effort will continue uh, for as long as uh, President Obama is in office. Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, two things. Uh, we know that uh, the president is looking forward to meeting with Putin uh, in Camp David. Uh, that means that uh, the Russians will probably take part in the G8. They will probably not take part in the NATO Russia Council. Uh, does it have anything to do with uh, separating the two events, moving one of them out of Chicago? No. 
just shooting down a rumor. Uh, and, and second, uh, on the World Bank, the uh, deadline for the nomination is coming up this Friday. Uh, on the what, sorry? World Bank. Uh -huh. uh, oh, right. no, no nominations yet. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, has this election been made and just not announced? Or has there been no selection? And w w why? <laughs> Rather than give you a play-by-play -play or uh, an update uh, on the uh, conversations internally on this issue, I'll simply say that we have no announcement to make uh, on that issue. Uh, I have no announcement on a timeline <laughs> to make. Go ahead. Ford Motor Company has announced that they will invest in India $1 billion, uh, and uh, also several other U.S. companies are going into India. What I'm asking is, is this a shift from U.S. companies investing in China now to India? You know, I, I haven't made that assessment myself, and I haven't heard uh, any assessments made uh, with regards to that. Obviously, India is a growing uh, economy, and, uh, and, and I'm sure one that uh, American companies view as uh, having great potential for uh, their products, uh, but I don't have any comment beyond that. And second, as far as uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan is concerned, um, since Afghanistan has now uh, bringing those who were supporting Al-Qaeda and Taliban now into the mainstream of uh, accepting the Afghanistan constitution, mm -hmm. my question is now that can you do this, uh, as far as you said yesterday, that U.S.-Pakistan relations are now complicated. What is the complications are there between the two countries' relations? And second, can you do all these transitions without the Pakistan's full support and help for combating all these terrorism and al-Qaeda from the region? Well, one of the reasons why the relationship with uh, Pakistan remains uh, extremely important to us because of the, is because of the role that uh, Pakistan plays uh, in our efforts to achieve our objectives in Afghanistan and achieve our objectives uh, in terms of uh, taking the fight to and ultimately defeating al-Qaeda. Uh, there is a parliamentary-led process underway in Pakistan, and we respect that process, and we will continue uh, awaiting the outcome of that process to hear formally from the Pakistani government about how they would like to engage moving forward. Um, it would not be productive uh, for me to comment beyond that on uh, specific recommendations or reports in the press. Uh, but I think it's important also to note that the United States has critical national security priorities that we continue to pursue, including counterterrorism efforts uh, aimed at, as I, as I said, at al-Qaeda, uh, strengthening Afghan security and supporting Afghan-led reconciliation. All are areas uh, where we believe we have common goals with Pakistan, and we continue to <clears throat> move forward on those areas uh, because they're in our national security interest. You know what, I think you asked for two, I got, you got four. Let me leave it at that. Alexis. Thank you. We have the justice at the top of the briefing, but some House Democrats are finding some positive elements in the Ryan plan, things that they think are grounds for further talks. For instance, the example they gave was the elimination of the alternative minimum tax proposal because it hit so many middle class Americans. Is the President in the White House believe that there are some positive elements in the plan today that are food for thought and talks down the road? Well, I, I, I haven't seen uh, the comments that you refer to. Uh, the idea that tax reform is a good idea is certainly one that I think is broadly shared uh, uh, by uh, members of both parties and, and certainly this, this President. The problem is that uh, you, when you present all the uh, good things in tax reform, like, hey, I'm going to give you a tax break, and hey, I'm going to eliminate the AMT, and then have no details on how you would pay for them, and given your priorities, uh, that you have very robustly expressed in terms of uh, not asking the wealthy to pay more, not asking uh, corporations to give up their subsidies like the oil and gas corporations, not asking hedge fund managers uh, to pay uh, income tax at the rates that everybody else pays, uh, then it's pretty evident who's going to get stuck with the bill. It's going to be uh, middle of class Americans, it's going to be uh, seniors on Medicare, it's going to be uh, families with uh, disabled children. It's, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunately the same, you know, list of, uh, uh, of those who would be uh, bearing the burden uh, for this, uh, you know, the benefits that go disproportionately to the wealthiest Americans that, that, that existed last time we had a Ryan budget proposal. And, um, you know, the fact that, you know, 
people all agree that there should be tax reform doesn't mean that the specifics don't matter because they matter a heck of a lot to every American out there uh, who has to make ends meet. Um, so we, uh, you know, I think we've seen pretty clearly that what this proposal does not do is uh, take the serious approach to getting our fiscal house in order that everyone who's serious about this issue says you have to take. I mean, you guys ask me a lot about the Simpson-Bowles Commission, the President created it, what's, what's his view on it, you know? Shouldn't his proposal mirror that? And the fact is, it does very much uh, mirror uh, the central tenets of Simpson-Bowles. Uh, one thing that's often not noted is that not a single House Republican on that commission voted for it. Chairman Ryan did not support it. So I think that when we talk about uh, what everyone agrees has to be the responsible approach to deficit reduction, we look at uh, who have put forward different plans that embrace that balanced approach, and then look at the Republican proposal emerging from the House, you have to acknowledge the very grave differences between them, which I did today. We done? Thanks very much, guys.